Hi everybody. Um, I think we're just going to make a start, even though one of our speakers <coughs> is going to be a little bit late, and I'm sure there's going to be people coming in, but I think we'll just start. So um, this part of the panel is entitled Remembering 1916 Together, Anarchist Perspectives. Um, and I suppose we're all fairly familiar with 1916 and so on, but among other things that we'll be discussing is um, I suppose revisionism and so on, I, um, in relation to public discourse around 1916, um, for me would be sort of summed up in the banner that we saw over College Green, you might be familiar with that, um, where we had four historical figures, none of whom had anything to do with 1916. This was put up by Dublin City Council, and so we had uh, Grattan, Parnell, Redmond and O'Connell. None of whom were involved in 1916, three of whom were dead before it happened, um, and Redmond was very opposed to it. And every single one of them were constitutional nationalists, so they would have been opposed to direct action of such as what took place in the Rising. So I suppose that's sort of the context, but I'll just introduce our speakers quickly. So beside me I have uh, Andrew Flood. He's a WSM member um, in Dublin here, and this is Fanula Nikribarth. Um, she's a WSM member in Belfast, and Donald Fallon will be with us shortly, hopefully. Um, he's a historian. Um, so I think I might just give the floor over to Andrew, seeing as time is passing. So it's Andrew Flood. Thanks. Uh, I've mostly found the uh, a lot of the stuff around the commemorations quite alienating. The state stuff in particular. I mean, that's fairly obvious uh, as to why. I think Donald will be talking about that in more detail. But uh, quite a lot of the kind of alternative stuff as well just hasn't really talked to me. The only exception being some of the local history project stuff that Study Batter and Smithfield Group, for instance, have been putting on. Um, the other big problem uh, I found with it is it's completely ruined Banana Republic for me. That's the old Boomtown Rats tracks from the 70s that I used to quite like. But with Bob Geldof's utterances of the last few months, you sort of then see it in an entirely different light. And you're like, oh, God, that's a shame. Um, and the problem, I think, with the kind of Bob Geldof and Joe Duffy stuff is it's actually made it very difficult to take a sort of critical look at the rising because you start to look like you're aligning yourself with the sort of rubbish they've been spouting. But despite that, and I'm opening with that as a disclaimer, uh, that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, the important thing is, I mean, anarchists have a, there's an anarchist expression in relation to the Russian Revolution and the, and the way it degenerated, and it's that Stalin didn't fall from the moon, uh, you know, and it, so that's basically the idea that the roots of the degeneration didn't start with Stalin, but went back to the practice of Leninism. And I'd like to look at the Easter Rising and in particular the proclamation in the same sort of respect. So in, to translate it, basically to say that De Valera and even to an extent Bertie didn't fall from the moon, that what they came from was also part of the story of the Rising. Too often we fail to acknowledge that and so create the impression that the movements and ideas of 1916 represent some sort of blueprint for today, rather than a flawed experience whose lessons include what not to do and what not to say. Um, the first problem I'd look at is the retreat from international, uh, international, internationalism contained in the proclamation, and in particular, of course, the, the uh, phrase about the gallant allies in Europe, normally understood to mean German imperialism. Um, I spent the day of the 19th anniversary of the Rising out at Baldonnell Airport. Uh, I was fairly alienated from that one as well. And about 40 of us had gone out there to uh, try and occupy the airfield to protest the ongoing refueling of US planes that were destined for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, in the 1910s and worse the 1940s, uh, Germany was the gallant ally willing to ship us guns. In the 1980s, it was Libya. And with the turn to respectability of the peace process, visits to the White House and US envoys to Ireland became the goal. So there's always been that tendency to uh, look at undermining British power in Ireland by looking to the other major imperial powers. The second thing I want to look at is um, the, the, the way the proclamation talks about divisions in Irish society, uh, and in particular uh, the phrase about cherishing all the children of the nation equally. Now in late 1915 and in early 1916, uh, Connolly was seriously considering staging a rising with just the citizens' army. He didn't think the volunteers were serious about it. And in fact, at a certain point, 
the IRB leadership involved in planning the rising essentially kidnapped him. He vanished for a while uh, in order to bring him to a meeting and to explain that, no, no, we're really serious as well. We should be working together on that. Uh, and in fact, uh, you capture some of the suspicion uh, the other leadership had of Connolly uh, from Patrick Pierce's words of 1915 when he said, Connolly is most dishonest in his methods. In public, he says the war is a war forced on Germany by the Allies. In private, he says the Germans are just as bad as the British and that we ought to do the job ourselves. As for writings in his paper, if he wanted to wreck the whole business, he couldn't go, go a better way about it. He will never be satisfied until he goads us into action and then you will think most of us are too moderate and want to guillotine half of us. <laughs> um, however, a deal was reached and there was a joint rising. If the citizen army had gone out alone, it wouldn't ha probably wouldn't have been on the compromise wording of the proclamation about cherishing all the children of the nation equally, or the even bigger fudge of the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland. When you hear those phrases, you've got to ask which people. By the 1910s, Ireland wasn't just a country of tenant farmers and absentee landlords, you know, with the landlords presumably vanishing post-independence. Dublin wasn't simply the tenement slums of Strumpet City, but also the 22,000 households who in the 1911 census uh, said they, their homes had more than 10 bedrooms. In fact, if you look at the GDP figures, as David Mac Williams did in a recent article to, you know, to argue that maybe the, the rising was a mistake, the Irish appeared to be on the pig's back relative to a lot of the rest of the world. But of course, the problem with the GDP figures and averages is that they often, and in this case very much, hid extreme divisions of wealth and poverty, in the same sort of way that the phrase people of Ireland did in the proclamation. Uh, writing in the Workers' Republic before the rising, in fact, when they thought they might be going out on their own, uh, Connolly included what you can sort of read as what might have been an intended program otherwise, in which he said, all the railways at once to be confiscated and made public property no compensation being given to the shareholders. All necessary ships ought at once to be taken from their owners without compensation and without apology. Let the government take the factories from the manufacturers and immediately confiscate all the idle land. The enormous quality of splendid land lying island, lying island in demenses and private estates of the nobility and gentry. And put labours upon it to grow crops to feed the multitude. As the property classes have so shamelessly sold themselves to the enemy, the economic conscription of their property will cause a few qualms to who, whosoever shall administer the Irish government in the first days of freedom. Now, there's pretty obviously an enormous gap between the language that's used there, which is basically a language of class warfare, and the, what, what, uh, what appeared in the proclamation. That becomes important when you move on from the 1916 period and you look at the War of Independence or the Tan War, whatever you prefer to call it, um, and why the British Empire found it necessary to, to reach a deal um, I, and that, I mean, I remember as a kid, I was quite puzzled by this. You know, I mean, the British Empire was coming out of World War I, a period when it had millions of men under arms. It had, you know, large stacks of tanks. It had biplanes. So how the hell did uh, flying columns involving a few hundred people defeat an empire? How did that actually work? Um, so I think part of the story is, is understanding the process that happened here. I mean, once the uh, war got underway and the primary targets were often things like lo local police barracks or the court systems, so in effect the IRA removed British law and order, uh, and in that vacuum, uh, workers and uh, farmers uh, quickly filled a, a vacuum through workplace occupations and land occupations across what were in, were in effect semi-liberated zones. So in that period, we see no less than five general strikes. There's over a dozen local strikes where, you know, a whole town goes on strike. Uh, you have the Limerick Soviet, of course, most famously. Uh, and all these things are taking place in order to maintain the exclusion of British law and order. Uh, another thing that's of particular importance in that period was the refusal by train workers to transport either munitions or armed soldiers. So all those things working together had the effect of creating fairly large areas of the countryside where essentially law and order had broken down. And where you have a big wealth divide, where you have people with huge amounts of land and people with no land, if you remove that sort of rule of law, well, what happens is workers act on that and uh, people without land act on it and they start seizing workplaces and they start taking over land. Um, the general strike of, Ma of April 1920, the Manchester Guardian had a rather interesting quote on that, where it said, the direction of affairs passed during the strike to these workers' councils which were formed not on a local but on a class basis. 
In most places, the police abdicated and the maintenance of order was taken over by the local workers' council. In fact, it is no exaggeration to trace the flavour of proletarian dictatorship about some aspects of the strike. Now, that quote captures a couple of things. And one of the important things is the international aspect, which is that the British establishment and the establishment in Ireland and elsewhere was worried not only about what was happening in Ireland, but also about the Russian Revolution, the influence of the Russian Revolution, and the wave of revolutions that was spreading across Europe. So they tended to see things through that sort of context. Uh, conventional Republican histories hardly mention uh, this uprising as anything more than an adjunct to the military struggle. And it's not, just, uh, it's not hard to see why, because the carrot that brought Britain to the negotiation table was the use of the Sinn Féin court system that was set up and the IRA to limit and in many cases suppress the movement of land seizures, returning land to its former owners. Uh, Pat O'Donnell, who was officer commanding of the 2nd Brigade of the IRA at the time, observed in 1963, so looking back at this period, that many an IRA man in jail in 1922 and 23 cursed his use as a defender of pure ideals to patrol estate walls, enforce decrees for rent, arrest, and even order out of the country leaders of local land agitation. Another aspect I think that particularly when we look back at the proclamation from now is what I'd call the uh, God-bothering aspects. Uh, I borrow that from train spotting. Um, <laughs> because now we know what was to come. Uh, so not only does the proclamation open with in the name of God, it closes with putting the Irish Republic under the protection of the Most High God. If the vagueness which covers the wealth divide was to be the materialist basin, basis for the reaction that followed uh, uh, after 1921, Religion was to provide the ideological glue that not only made reaction possible, but escalated it from the economic sphere to the social sphere. Of course, the excuse that's offered is that the text was of its time. Everybody was religious back there, so what could you expect? Uh, and there's a certain amount of truth to that. It's also true the nationalist revival of the 1880s had erased the earlier anti-clerical aspects of republicanism in a successful compromise with the Catholic Church that had cemented southern nationalism as firmly as it alienated many northern Protestants. But it wasn't the only option. Uh, the proclamation of the 1803 rebellion, so that Ro that's Robert Emmett's rebellion, not only felt no need to open and close with references to God, it isn't there in the middle, uh, it declared church lands to be the property of the nation. Ken Loach has done us something of a favour in making two films that explain the, the unrolling of reaction <coughs> in a popular and easily accessible way. Uh, the first is the obvious one, and probably most people have seen it, which is The Wind That Shakes the Barley, which doesn't just tell the story of the battle against the Black and Tans, but also illustrates the tensions within the revolution over the wealth divide. But his more recent and lesser-known film, Jimmy's Hall, set a decade later, uh, serves the, to tell, I think, the same story. It's almost an extension of what happens next. And that looks at the way religion was used as the ideological glue of reaction. In this case, by telling the true story of how the radical organizer Jimmy Galton was driven out not only from his birthplace, so the, you know, the town he was born in, but bizarrely departed to the United States. And I remember when I first came across that story, I was like, what? How, how could that have happened? Like, what was the legal basis of it? Um, and of course, there wasn't a legal basis. It was an extrajudicial alliance between the Garda and the institutions of power. Now, at times you think, oh, that's an exceptional story. You know, that's this weird occurrence in the middle of the 30s. What the hell was that about? But actually, I, you also realize it's not that exceptional. I mean, that, that extrajudicial role of the Guardi was also the role that dumped women into the Magdalene laundries throughout most of the history of the state without any sort of legal process in most cases, and also captured and returned women who escaped uh, their clutches right into the 1960s. I'm too pushed for time to cover it here, but the most extraordinary weakness of the proclamation is its complete attempt to evade the sectarian division, which, if anything, was even more apparent in the 1910s than it is today. Uh, instead, we're simply told that the Republic is oblivious to the differences clearly fo foisted by an alien government which have divided a minority in the past. I mean, yeah, it's really quite hard to work out how that ended up there. Um, after the 90th commemorations, I wrote a fairly long article titled Nationalism, Socialism and Partition that looks at the reality and what the possibilities were uh, in terms of breaking the mold. But really, those possibilities would have had, you'd have to be starting earlier than 1916 to make any use of them. Um, so Joe Duffy and Bob Geldof have ensured that I sim can't simply get away with listing some of the negative lessons of the rising without entering into unpleasant associations. So I'm going to quickly close on what I think are three of the most important but less talked about positive lessons. Um, the first one, and the least controversial, 
is that it spearheaded uh, an anti-colonial revolt, revolt that became global and that basically took almost all that pink off the map, not just for Britain, but for the other major empires as well. Um, we tend to see the, 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 the international connection as mostly just being about the US, but it's actually, I think, part of a much wider process. Uh, some of the participants, like Roger Casement and, of course, Connolly, were relatively explicit about that aspect. But, in fact, even if you go back to the, the Fenians, they'd made limited attempts to build links with other anti-colonial movements, including helping to fund an Indian nationalist paper uh, back in the, uh, the 1880s. Uh, and in the aftermath of the Rising, with the apparent partial victory of the War of Independence, Ireland became an example for the construction of anti-colonial movements elsewhere. I don't know if people heard it, but the RT Radio had quite an interesting uh, interview, basically, which was with an Indian woman who'd migrated to Ireland, and she was just talking about how the Rising had influenced the politics of her grandfather, who otherwise was a pretty terrible Hindu nationalist, in the sense of how she was actually describing him. Um, but you can, see, you can see that sort of influence there as well. The second thing is looking at the Rising through the lens of revolutionary syndicalism. If you take a small step back and look at the Rising not on its own, but as one event in a period of militant struggles that extended from the 1909 dock strike in Belfast through the 1913 lockout here in Dublin, through those land and factory occupations of the 1918 and 1919 period, and then go back to Belfast for the 1919 engineering strike. Uh, and here you discover not only that Northern Protestant workers were also deeply involved in militant struggle in the same period against the establishment, but that this type of struggle, struggle didn't stop at the Irish Sea. It also extended across Britain to Europe, the US and beyond. Uh, and this is what some historians in, in, in the Irish context, Emmett O'Connor's work is worth reading, talk about as the syndicalist wave. Uh, a, couple, a period of a couple of decades where workers internationally organized in militant rank and file general unions in order to just not win better wages, but to seize workplaces and institute a new society. That wave was defeated in some countries by fascism, but in most places it was diverted into the top-down status project of Leninism on one hand, but also in anti-colonial contexts like our own context, internationalism. And the final <coughs> positive lesson I want to mention is direct action. Um, the, the, the movement of this period was not one of electoralism and lobbying. There was a certain amount of electoralism, but that was not what defined it. It was one of protest, it was not one of protest and go home, but of radical direct action. Uh, this is very literally true of 1916 itself, the entire basis of which was to use armed force and the seizure of government buildings uh, to declare the republic into being. Uh, that's about as far as a buzz, BuzzFeed petition as you can get. <laughs> Uh, but it's also true of the revolutionary syndicalist movement I've talk just talked about internationally. Solving the land question by seizing the land or taking over your workplace and declaring a Soviet was a very long way indeed from the modern practices of the Labour Relations Board or the Land Commission. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to end on that. Uh, I've written a number of pieces, mostly around the, the 19th anniversary. If people are interested in finding out more about the stuff I've been talking about there, if you look at uh, the WSM website at www.wsm.ie slash 1916. You'll find that there. Thanks. Thanks for that, Andrew. That's really great. I think we'll move straight on to Fanula now, just because we're a bit tight for time. So, Fanula, please. Yep. Uh, so, I'm mainly going to look at the commemorations and what we can take from them. So, um, it's obvious that the political establishment has a lot of reasons for the amount of revisionism and conservatism we've seen around the, the, the commemorations, mainly because they don't want anything like it on their hands, so they, they don't want to be inspiring too many people. So among all this conservatism and revisionism, to me, what the commemorations all stink of is just post-colonial mentality um, of the establishment and of the vast majority of us living here. So um, I'm gonna speak very, very briefly about the commemorations in the South before I move on and kind of focus on the North. So uh, just to clarify by what I mean by post-colonial, it's not that we've moved on from colonialism that it's over and done with. It means that we're out of the area of colonialism, but we're still living with the effects of it. So um, I'm going to use the example of the language just to illustrate what I mean by colonialism, like the, the effects of it. So um, language destruction is top of every colonizer's agenda. So um, whenever you take someone's language away from them, you do three things. The first is you strip them of their identity 
and you give them a new identity that relates to the new oppressive forces. The second thing is you cause them to feel alienated by the way of life that they previously had, which makes them more susceptible to adapt to this new way of life that you're giving them, and also an inferiority, a feeling of inferiority to the way of life that they did have. Um, you cause them to feel shame, stupidity, and backwardsness, uh, when it, and again, inferiority, primitive, primitiveness, whenever they think of their old way of life. So I'm going to concentrate on these features of identifying with the oppressors, a dependency upon them, the feelings of shame and um, backwardness. So whenever we look at the establishment in the South's commemoration, there isn't a single ounce of pride that there was a rise and there isn't a single ounce of pride that those imperial chains were broken. Um, we just have to look at the time wall, really. You know, ever since the rising, the establishment has been apologising ever since because of it. They're kind of saying, we're so sorry that you no longer rule us. And um, it's it's kind of the thing of they've been, in their mannerisms, the way that they rule us, you know, what's the difference between the Dial and Westminster, you know, even the House of Lords and the Shannon, you know, it's the same kind of system. Um, I the only difference really is in how we vote first past the post over there, uh, proportional representation over here. But um, basically now it's gotten to the stage where this apology has been written in stone and handing over to them, you know, all of the symbolism of how we've ruled. That's kind of outdated. They want to make it official so they've stuck up a wall. So um, we then have, uh, that's kind of like the Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael mentality. And we have Sinn Féin posturing as an alternative, you know, up in arms about the the wall, calling it inappropriate at moderate, and then the <laughs> Facebook warriors are all over it, tearing in the state, giving off about how much of a disgrace it is and all the rest of it. So then um, let's just look at what they're doing in the north. So the, the storm and speaker um, is a Sinn Féin MLA, Mitchell McLaughlin, and he himself has actually said that we should commemorate the British forces in Ireland at the time. Like, th they actually think we're stupid, you know. In the South, they're up in arms, but in the North, it's let's do the exact same thing. Um, not to mention that, but they, they attend services to commemorate British soldiers. These are like... And it's, it's not just the soldiers of the Somme. It's all of the British forces. So it's the same ones who were in charge of Bloody Sunday, the same ones who were responsible for the Bally Murphy massacre, Iraq, all of these atrocities that we hear about. Um, so then then we hear the line, you know, this is good for peace building, you know, commemorate more criminals. And then um, anyone who's kind of sympathising with the Shinners, I can kind of hear them shit, no, but, you know, they're in power now and this is what they have to do. This is their responsibility. So, okay, let's entertain that. So that's the state stuff. So let's look at what they're doing on a community level. So, um They've pissed off the community, basically, by taking our international law, which is used to highlight anti-oppression struggles, and uh, they stuck Edward Carson's face on it. And his face is right at the very beginning of the law. So whenever the, it first went up, um, I remember driving past, and I just saw, you know, the outline of the, the cars, and I thought, that looks like the Lauren gun running. And uh, my dad was next to me, and he was like, they're definitely going to stick Carson up in that, because, like, the guy who paints it, he's a shinner. Um, so then I was coming back from town later that evening and sure enough there was Carson's face up in the wall so what do you do you go and paint bomb it what do the shinners do <laughs> the shinners then they're ruining our wall this is historical revisionism like they actually claim that the people who paint bomb the wall and who were giving off about it that we were the ones being revisionists so they then said in defense that they're trying to sell to the say the story in 1916 and um, this is preposterous it's, it's at the very beginning of the wall so they're starting off the story of 1916 with the lauren gun running like it's been a while since i did my eye level history but i know it didn't start with that um so, um, but it's actually nothing to do with telling the story of 1916. This is the post-colonial habit that they have picked up of appeasing to unionism all the time, bending over backwards to appease unionism. You know, it was only two years ago, Martin McGuinness was over at the state dinner with um, uh, the Queen and all the rest of it, dressed exactly like um, the oppressors, basically. And uh, this is 
our one true Republican Party as they place themselves. A few years ago, they had a mural up on the falls, actually, at James Connolly's face. It's that quote about, you know, if there's to be a revolution, there must be a revolutionary party, implying that they're our revolutionary party. Um, and even they, they can't shake this sense of shame whenever it comes to talking about liberation. So how are they any different from the politicians we have in Westminster? You know, uh, they may not take their seat in Westminster, but they're basically, they might as well, you know, and they've emulated every single bit of the oppressors, which is just, it's a common symptom of colonialism. So then on the left, where does this leave us? So um, this is going to be largely concentrating on the North because it's kind of an interesting situation where, um, you have left Republicans who won't really have much to do with the rest of the left, but mainly because they've been told that they're not welcome because they're sectarian, but we'll get to that anyway. Um, and there isn't as much revisionism whenever it comes to these guys, but there is an absurd level of glorification and of, of all the leaders, not just Conley, of every single one of them, which is... It, that in itself is lacking any analysis of the leaders of the time because these groups claim to be anti-capitalist and all the rest of it, but the, the leaders' politics weren't really worth writing home about in, in this case whenever you're talking about dismantling capitalism or women's liberation because they're essentially big boys' clubs and they don't want women involved, really. Um, and then we have these, these so-called leftists who won't acknowledge 1916 at all because if you acknowledge anything to do with the Catholic community, you're sectarian. Because in the left, there is an awful lot of Catholics in it. Protestants are a minority in the left. Um, so there's this kind of feeling of we need to make it more comfortable to Protestants. So what do we do? We sweep everything under the rug. And if you mention anything to do with um, Catholic oppression in the North, the Troubles, you're being sectarian. You can shout about imperialism in any other country in the world, uh, host as many public meetings as you like about it, but as soon as you mention it in, in Belfast, you're divisive and uh, you're being sectarian. So, um, actually, they actually, this is a, a, an amazing example of that. You know the AFA symbol? It has the hurl in it, beating the swastika. Um, Whenever the Protestant coalition were organizing uh, for anti-refugee rallies in the north, um, and Belfast Antifa got organized again, and you know that's Alpha Ireland symbol, um, so we used it because it's relevant to, to us as well in the north, and uh, these leftists in a party begin with S and with P. You can draw the dots. Um, they. Uh, they claim that the that it was a sectarian symbol because the hurl was in it. Like whenever I think of sectarianism, it's civil rights protesters being beaten to a pulp and burnt hollet, or the need for civil rights in general. You know, it's fourteen dead and die. It's not a hurl. Um, but this is another example of post-colonialism, you know, indigenous culture, it's divisive, it's reactionary. And you know what? It's primitive, so just forget about it. And then um, so what so what we need down here is I'm just going to sum up by saying what I think the way forward is. We actually we need a movement that actually acknowledges that uh, colonialism and imperialism happened here because sweeping it under the rug is an absurd position to take. Um, but at the same time, you kind of have to strike the balance between calming down the nationalist aspect of it and fo and focusing it on undoing colonialism. Um, we still have injustices that remain unresolved, particularly in the North. And in order for us to move on, we do need to resolve them, especially if we are, to, if we, st we still do have uh, divided communities in Belfast. And if we're looking to tie them together, we, we, we really do need to resolve these issues from the past and move on from them. Um, so while we're working to dismantle capitalism, you know, white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, all oppressive systems really, we, we do need to simultaneously undo colonialism. We don't actually put enough emphasis on how vital colonialism has been to capitalist development, you know, through pitting in an exploitative system um, by making the labour export orientated. Um, and uh, I'm going to leave it there, actually. Thank you.
Thanks, Anula. Um, I say everyone will have a lot to say. Um, I think we'll just move on straight to Donald now. Um, so, Donald, thanks. Yeah. Can I have ten minutes? Yeah. Great. So, yeah, no yeah. so uh, it's it's a pretty sad indictment, I suppose, of politics on the island of Ireland that the award for the most honest remark about the Easter Rising so far should go to Arlene Foster uh, of the Democratic Unionist Party. But in refusing to partake in commemorations of the centenary of the Rising, she outlined her opposition to 1916 on the basis that it was, quote, a violent attack on the British Empire. And indeed it was. Uh, though perhaps looking at the state commemorations here in the South, you'd be forgiven for thinking otherwise. Uh, it's worth saying at the beginning that the 1916 Rising was not a socialist insurrection. Uh, while it was an insurrection in which socialists played a very proactive part, we have to make that, we have to make that, that point. Uh, there's always a great danger in projecting our own ideas and ambitions onto the past. We don't know how Patrick Pierce would have felt about Irish water. We don't know how Rosie Hack would feel about the Eighth Amendment. Yet on the basis of what it was, uh, I believe there is more than enough reason to celebrate the rising as a blow against imperialism at a time when that imperialism was unleashing an unprecedented slaughter on the continent of Europe. There's been a lot of nonsense written in recent weeks in the pages of the British right-wing press uh, each article worse than the last. The Tory graph press have fallen over themselves to denounce the rising in Dublin. And they draw comparisons between the actions of the Irish volunteers on the streets of Dublin and jihadist fascists in the Middle East. Uh, in the Telegraph, Charles Moore went as far as to say that the modern equivalent of Patrick Pierce was to be found in the Islamic State, accusing Pierce of the, quote, distasteful confusion of political, political fanaticism with fate. We've heard a lot from the Daily Telegraph and others about the blood sacrifice of 1916. And I believe there was a sickening blood sacrifice in 1916. There was a poisonous ideology, a poisonous nationalism across Europe in 1916. And that blood sacrifice didn't kill thousands of people. It killed millions. Uh, it wasn't Pierce. It was John Redmond who proclaimed that no people can be said to have rightly proved their nationhood and their power to maintain it until they have demonstrated their military prowess. And although Irish blood has reddened the earth of every continent, never until now have we as a people set a national army in the field. Similar rhetoric was being used right across Europe. Since 2014, there's been a reinvention of the First World War in an Irish context that I think is very sickening to observe. We're told that that war is part of a shared history. There is a shared history on the island of Ireland. The working class in Ireland have one history. Our shared history is found in things like the Presbyterian radicals of the 18th century, the outdoor relief strike of the 1930s. Only yesterday there was a ceremony in Belfast to commemorate the fact Dublin firefighters went there when the city was blitzed 75 years ago. But we're told that the First World War now is the part of our shared history we must celebrate. And we're told that this war has positive dimensions for the peace process. We can't glorify the violence on the streets of Dublin, but how many more died in the first six hours of the Battle of the Somme than died in the 1916 Rising, the War of Independence, the Civil War, the Border Campaign, and the recent Troubles? Last year, we had the spectacle of a government minister, Aidan O'Reardon, reading the revenge poem, Flanders Fields, in Glasnevin Cemetery. We've increasingly seen the promotion of the 11th of November, Remembrance Sunday, or Armistice Day, by the political establishment here, in spite of the fact a separate day already exists for the commemoration and remembrance of dead Irish servicemen in all wars. It's been levelled against the Easter Rising that this was a Catholic insurrection, an attempt to establish a Catholic state, and you have to acknowledge, it's a historical fact, many of the leaders were devoutly Catholic. Sean Connolly, the first rebel to die in 1916, is a member of the Workers' Militia, the Irish Citizen Army, he refuses to join the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the Athenians, on the basis that the Pope condemns secret societies. Michael Mallon of the Citizen Army encourages his young son to join the priesthood in the aftermath of the insurrection. But while the majority of the rebel participants were Catholic, and the proclamation did invoke God, it was strictly non-sectarian. Uh, I agree with historians in recent times that perhaps the most misunderstood line of the proclamation has been its promise to cherish all the children of the nation equally, most likely intended as a reference to those of all faiths who belonged in the nation. The promise of religious and civil liberty was remarkable, and it was Patrick Pierce, the son of an English Unitarian, who first read this document under the portico of the GPO. If this was a sectarian land grab for a Catholic state, it would have been news to a lot of people in the GPO, including Seamus McGowan, the Protestant bomb maker of the Irish Citizen Army, or Arthur Shields, the Protestant Irish volunteer. There are others too, like Kathleen Lynn, the Norgrove family, or any number of Irish Citizen Army members. A very strong minority of the Citizen Army were Protestant working class. The entire hope gun running from beginning to end, was conceived and executed by Anglo-Irish Protestant rebels like Erskine Childers, Alice Stopford Green and Roger Casement. Anti-sectarianism wasn't merely something that was muttered in half-serious tones, it was taken seriously by the rebels. Patrick Pierce complained about the ancient order of Hibernians, calling them the Pope's brass band. Terence McSweeney, the Lord Mayor of Cork, who bravely died in hunger strike during the War of Independence, he denounced Hibernianism as a divisive sectarian ideology, writing that 
English politicians to serve the end of dividing Ireland have worked on religious feelings in the north with the aim of destroying our unity. Hibernianism creates an unnatural atmosphere of sectarian rivalry in Ireland. Anti-sectarianism, but not secularism, it is worth making that point as Andrew did, uh, is a key component of the proclamation. There are other remarkable progressive dimensions to it, the promise of universal suffrage. We should remember that it wasn't only women who were disenfranchised, you know, in the Ireland of 1916. Many working class men were too, you know, you needed to be a property owner. When we are told that the majority in Ireland had supported the Irish Parliamentary Party, ask yourself, what majority is that? You know, just who was entitled to vote? Uh, the 1916 proclamation was not the most radical Republican proclamation. Emmett's proclamation in 1803 is remarkable. So was the Fenian proclamation of 1867. And it too promised universal suffrage, which in the context of the 1860s is even more remarkable. It said that the soul of Ireland, the present in the possession of an oligarchy, belongs to us all, the Irish people, and to us it must be restored. We declare also in favour of absolute liberty of consciousness and complete separation of church and state. So there is a criticism of the 1916 proclamation, said in some ways it is less radical than some that had come before it. There were reactionary dimensions to the separatist movement, as there always is in separatist movements, uh, in the early 20th century. You know, when you, some of the leading rebels, even of the Easter Rising, certainly lacked any class analysis. Sean McDermott, uh, who signed the proclamation, Sinn Féin, an IRB organiser, he wrote in private correspondence during the lockout that he feared the influence solidarity from the English working class would have. He wrote that socialism and the sympathetic strike are dangerous, ruinous weapons in Ireland at the present time. The present labour troubles are doing a lot of harm. All this talk about the friendliness of the English working man and the brotherhood of man. The English food ships are having a very unnational influence. The class analysis of some rebels was also non-existent, it should be acknowledged. W.J. Brennan Whitmore, a volunteer on O'Connell Street during the rebellion, he blamed the looting of 1916 on what he called the scum of the city. Uh, another rebel complained about the denizens of the slums. And for us on the left, it's a surprising and uncomfortable fact that those who are most troubled by the looters, and indeed those who advocated drastic action against them, sometimes came from the Irish Citizen Army, who perhaps felt that these people brought shame on their own class. Internationalism was a core pillar of political identity, I think, <coughs> for many of these radicals, even if Sean McDermott didn't share it. The proclamation speaks about Ireland as taking its place among the nations. Uh, in her statement to the Bureau of Military History, Helena Maloney talked about the proactive stance many of this generation took towards the cause of Indian nationalism, for example. Uh, they come in, or in Indian hair and the Daughters of Ireland, the organisation she belonged to. She remembered that one of her first actions was fly postering Dublin in honour of Madame Neldingra, an Indian nationalist who was executed for assassinating a British official in 1809. Unsurprisingly, the finest internationalism came from the left. James Connolly proclaimed that the socialist of another country is my fellow patriot, as the capitalist of my own is a natural enemy. And what about James Connolly's socialism? Uh, was Sean O'Casey right? Did he abandon it? Was Labour, did Labour, quote, lay its precious gift of independence on the altar of Irish nationalism, as Sean O'Casey believed, by taking part in the Rising? I don't believe O'Casey was right. And I think the proof of that is that only weeks before the Rising, in April 1916, in the pages of the Workers' Republic, James Connolly wrote, we are out for Ireland for the Irish, but who are the Irish? Not the rack-renting, slum-owning landlord, not the sweating, profit-grinding capitalist, not the sleek and oily lawyer, not the prostitute pressman, the hired liar of the enemy. No, these are not the Irish upon which the future depends. It's the Irish working class, the only secure foundation upon which an Irish nation can be reared. I'm baffled that Sean O'Casey didn't see his own words in the proclamation. The 1916 proclamation proclaims that the ownership of Ireland belongs to the people of Ireland. Sean O'Casey wrote the Citizen Army Constitution, which included the lines, the ownership of Ireland, moral and material, is vested of right in the people of Ireland. There are no gods in politics, you know, depending on what flag you fly. Marx, Lenin, Bakunin and Connolly were all mere mortals. Uh, and of course, we can criticise aspects of Connolly's political thinking, and we should. I think it's very clear when you read The Workers' Republic, as the rising was approaching, that Connolly became something of an apologist for the actions of the German state. Uh, but this owed more to realpolitik than anything else. You know, one volunteer, Joseph Lawless, remembered that the fact we were pro-German, insofar as Germany was Britain's enemy, um, we would have been pro-anything else that was fighting the British at the time. The First World War was a bosses war, played out with the lives of ordinary working men, and Germany was no victim. I think the way Connolly presents Germany as a victim of the First World War uh, as the rising approach is wrong. Bob Geldof might be surprised to hear uh, that little Catholic Belgium was no victim either. How strange that the architect of Live Aid should have failed to acknowledge the imperialist adventures of little Catholic Belgium and Africa uh, during his recent forays into history. The First World War to Bob Geldof was a noble struggle beside the slaughter of Easter week. So why did Connolly do what he did? Why did he align himself with a nationalist movement? We forget uh, that there was an uncomfortable fact that Connolly himself was a nationalist. He believed in the idea of an Irish nation. 
But he aligned himself with advanced nationalists who didn't share his entire vision of what that nation should look like. Martimo O'Connell, who was a member of the Volunteers, heard James Connolly speak only weeks before the rising, giving a lecture. And he believed, and I think he was right, that Connolly's entire world view, his entire political view, had been shaken to its foundations by the First World War and the manner in which socialist parties right across Europe threw themselves behind their national war efforts, supporting war recruitment. In England, the suffragettes you know, put their campaign on ice and support the war effort. Rosa Luxemburg denounced what she called socialist shield bearers of imperialism who supported the war. And I think it's clear that Connolly and others like them, what was appearing to happen on the continent was the collapse of the working class movement. The only spectre that was haunting Europe in 1914 and 1915 was unending capitalist war. And what about the line that we'd be better off had the rising not happened? Uh, I recently heard it said that if it wasn't for the rising, we would have the HSE and not the NHS. We wouldn't have the Eight Amendment. Uh, surely that would be news to the people of the North who live under the Union flag now in conditions that are no better than we have here. Would we be better off in the Empire? Well, how was Ireland governed before the insurrection? And why would it be better afterwards? Yes, there was a famine in Ireland in the 1840s. There are also famine conditions in the 1870s. Irish politicians set in the parliament that was on another island entirely, while unelected bureaucrats and officials controlled some key affairs from Dublin Castle. The Fenian newspaper Irish Freedom said that our country is run by a set of insolent officials to whom we are nothing but a lot of people to be exploited and kept in subjection. The executive power rests on armed force that preys on the people with battens if they have the gall to say that they do not like it. An unelected House of Lords on another island entirely had the power to stop home rule becoming a reality. And as Ronan Fanning has, Fanning has demonstrated in his recent book, Fake Pat, I don't think the British state was ever committed to the prospect of home rule in a meaningful way. We can't blame all of Ireland's social ills on the Brits, though we might like to from time to time. The tenement crisis in Dublin, you know, it was on the shoulders of local government and homebred gone beans. It was a former Dublin Lord Mayor and a so-called nationalist, Joseph Mead, who turned Henrietta Street into slumdom. The Finnish, John Bruton, former Taoiseach, tells us that the proclamation, which our school children are now being asked to regard as the founding stone of our democracy, left no room at all for democratic negotiation. Yet the gun wasn't brought into Irish politics by Patrick Pearce, Arthur Shields, or James Connolly. What of the Carsonites in the north, the UVF, who the authorities allowed to arm themselves to the teeth? What of the Curra mutiny, when the top brass of the British army made it clear that they would stand by if it came to confronting an armed paramilitary in the northeast of the country? I, any day of the week, will take the rebels of 1916 and the proclamation of 1916 over the warmongers of Berlin and Westminster or the sectarian bigotry of Edward Carson. While the 1916 Easter Rising may not have produced the most radical proclamation in an Irish context or a socialist programme as we wished it did, as a blow against imperialism and imperialist slaughter at the time, it deserves to be remembered and indeed saluted. Thanks, Donald. That's brilliant. Um, really great speeches. I, I'm going to open it up to the floor in one second, but I just think one thing really needs to be noted is a big sort of dilemma when we talk about 1916. It is very difficult for us to, to talk critically about it, right? Because given the sort of general atmosphere of revisionism and appeasement, and as you said, the post-colonial mentality, and I was really struck, Andrew, by what you said that when you were a child, you, you sort of wondered, how did this, you know, bunch of people basically defeat the empire, right? And I suppose the answer would be they didn't, <laughs> you know, because, you know, we've got the Irish flag flying and so on, and there's all these other issues. But it's just so difficult to discuss a lot of this. And, you know, the, the essentially, like, the economic structures are the same. The capitalist system is in place. And you've got your sort of post-colonial mentality that's maintaining that as well. So that's a cultural aspect of it, too. So... I won't say any more, but I, I'll just open it up. So, um, does anybody have anything they want to bring up for? Yeah. Question about Belfast in the north. Um, when I look at the north, I can see uh, working class Protestants is possibly the most disenfranchised and negative people on the island, you know. And I'm not disenfranchised, but I wonder how do you imagine? I mean, I think it's a, a difficult one because um, 
like obviously the Protestant working class is alienated from the left and then you know you have the fallen rate of you know like school achievements but especially like in the Shankill um I don't think the the way to go about making the left more inclusive is to ignore past atrocities that have happened which is what we currently have now and it's this thing of we just sweep everything under the rug and um there's problems with that because it's if it was anywhere else in the world it'd be fine problem we have is that whenever britain came to ireland we were all the one skin color so they had to use something else to divide us so they used religion and not everybody's religious anymore but like if i'm filling out an equality form you know i still say i'm from the catholic community even though i'm atheist and it's it's because and I've, a few times I've hit other, but then it's kind of like my name. People are the, the employer is going to be pedantic or whatever and say, "No, you're Catholic." But um, um, we we wouldn't have it anywhere else in left wing movements where we ignore past atrocities that happen to the vast majority of people. You know, to indigenous people, um, just in order to make the left somewhat more accom- um, somewhat more accommodating. It's um i think there needs to be more work done in protestant working class areas to say these things happened especially with younger people to say look it's not your fault but what you can do is you can kind of acknowledge that it did happen and um don't be an asshole about it basically i would suggest we take a batch of questions and then yeah. come back to yeah yeah so you have your hand up there the red jacket yeah. oh yeah there's a, there's a film of voices from the grave with all the boston college he also now included a uh, um, paramilitary from, from the IRA and, and the other parties. He also included members of the Irish Security Force, the British Security Force, and the reason RAC kind of closed on by it. If, if it has been being done, would, 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 it, would, it, would it be an enormous thing? Would it, would it be, do you think of this enormous loss for reconciliation and trying to find out the past, it, it, had, had the project been deserved? Like, as far as the team that Jerry Adams had re- rigged the election in, in, in Belfast, and, and these sort of things, Brendan Hughes and Reels and Gabriel and other things, do you think that, say, if, if more parliament had, had been disclosed more past, the fact more interesting the past, and including the members of the Garda and including the British force, would make people would try to find a form of truth and reconciliation? That, that, that it was closed down, it was closed down, this had to be closed down, this continued, and more uh, damage, uh, things, reconciliation, things first. Okay, yep. Uh, yeah. So absurd was the uh, big banner that had the uh, four people that nothing to do with 1916 on it. That, uh, I witnessed a Facebook campaign trying to put two talking on it because the <laughs> argument being that two talking about as much to do with 1916 was <laughs> Yeah, aside from that, uh, one of the things that isn't being focused uh, on a lot, uh, either in the mainstream press, or the right wing, or the central left, or even in the uh, right of the left press is the very inspiring example of what was done not just after the rising and during the Irish War of Independence, which was the setting up counter institutions to British rule in Ireland, setting up workers' councils, setting up popular courts that uh, negated the existing legal structure and set the seeds of what presumably was meant to be a more, maybe if not socialist, more socialistic. Uh, uh, social and political and economic structure that would take the place once uh, the war was finished. And uh, I think there's an awful lot we could learn from that as anarchists and as libertarian socialists because it is creating what's now commonly called a dual power in uh, in that kind of situation. And uh, yeah, I guess the question is what more could we do to learn from that example of setting up counter institutions uh, to, uh, to not only because. If, if we're ever going to transition long term from what we have now to what we want to get, it's not going to just be like we start a government building and then all of a sudden full communism. It's, it's going to be a very gradual process of building that new world in the old world. I'll just take one more question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, it's just another question of uh, the left uh, 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 amongst Protestants in the north. Um, the PUP, most members of the PUP consider themselves to be on the left. And most of them consider themselves to be socialists. Um, they're, but they're unionists. Their, their attitude is that they uh, 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 they want the union. And well, I'm not going to argue with them if that's what they want, that's what they want. Uh, I consider myself a socialist, and I consider them a socialist. But I think it's possible 
to be a socialist. And again, okay, so um, maybe we'll just deal with these questions and then we'll get some more. So um, the first one was just about this idea possibly of having a Truth and Reconciliation Week. Um, anyone want to comment on that particularly? Or? Uh, that was a great initiative, probably done badly. They, uh, the, those interviews are, I mean, they should not have been released as people, as individuals were dying. I think like the, the Bureau of Military History, and there were problems with the Bureau of Military History. You know, like, uh, some people refused to talk to the Bureau of Military History. Uh, this was the, the initiative in the 30s where they sat down with veterans and they recorded their memoirs. And there are problems with that in that they had the gloves on. They didn't want to talk about the Civil War, just the War of Independence rising. Uh, but they only released them, I think, 10, 15 years ago. So I think the, the Boston College, I mean, though they could have played a role in, in the reconciliation discussion. They should not have been released until a time, you know, down the line, like the Bureau yeah, of Military yeah, History yeah. tapes were. I think by releasing them one after the other, they became a, rather than something for community workers or academics to understand what happened in the North, they became just a media sensation. Yes, it's true. It's true. I think the, the one about uh, about the, the the Protestant working class, I suppose, they're always the for left Republicans, said the Holy Grail. You know, there's been no real attempt to engage with them either like, since the Republican Congress uh, in in the 1930s. So they maintain everyone in this room has a lot more in common with someone on the Shankill Road and Shrewsbury Road in Dublin. Uh, and when you look at the flag protests, I mean, as, as, as a left Republican, I thought at the time when it burst out, I was like, God, isn't this ridiculous? You know, a lot of people protesting with a flag. But those, pro those protests were really probably indicative of something else, which is the, the poverty and the conditions in, in, in working class Protestant Belfast. I think the PUP were probably wrong to align themselves so publicly uh, with a movement that on paper was about a flag. But there are the conditions in, in, in Protestant working class Belfast and, and the, the culture of Protestant working class Belfast, you know, is... is more, more akin to us than, than some of what you'll find down here. Um, so yeah, there was a question just about what we could learn from the, um, the alternative institutions, the counter institutions that were set up following the rising. Does anybody want to comment on that one? Or what Owen was asking about, the, you know, the revolutionary courts and the, sort of the parallel institutions. The doll courts and the Republican police, I and mean, they weren't always used in progressive ways. Uh, Frank Ryan and Pat O'Donnell and some of our veterans talk about them being used you know, against strikes, against Soviets. Uh, I think we spend a lot of time talking about the proclamation. We don't look at what came next, the democratic program in 1919, the democratic program the first all. Uh, there was no August Destinies or you know, poetic language in that. Uh, it was very much a, a, a program to govern an, an independent Ireland. And when you read it, it's, it's very left-wing as is. Uh, it was largely written by Thomas Johnson of the Labour Party and, and Sean T. O'Kelly from Sinn Féin got his hands on it and he said, I de it. <laughs> I'd, love to see, I'd love to see what it looked like before Sean T. O'Kelly got his hands on it. Uh, but later that was dismissed uh, by Kevin O'Higgins, a government minister, as mostly poetry. So the, the Republican police and the Dáil courts, while they were, uh, uh, while they were putting it up to the British in terms of saying, we have our own infrastructure, that infrastructure was sometimes used in favour of bosses as well as workers. Just there, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of coming at it from how the Irish diaspora is still from high school. The French and the Queen's visit to Australia. Um, I've actually come to Dublin to be here during this uh, centenary to kind of get an understanding of the creation myths, not only of the state, but also of national identity and ethnic identity. And what strikes me is growing up when I did that uh, part of Irish identity abroad anyway was a certain anti imperialist flavour and especially pushed by neutrality, which has completely been trashed with the use of Shannon and may have been undermined before that. And obviously neutrality comes from a, a very militant anti-conscription movement here in World War One. And I, I see the rising of an anti-war action. Obviously the Russian guys in the next year is an anti-war action. Not non-violent anti-war actions, but they're definitely anti-war actions. And I wonder why no one has fought that space in this in this battle of the myths. Um, you know, you're, as you said, you're criticising Sinn Féin or whatever, uh, folding into these joint commemorations of World War One, rather than holding the position that there was an anti-conscription movement here in Ireland, a militant one that was successful, and it actually played itself out in Australia. There were two referendums lost by the Australian government uh, because of Irish nationalism, not because of pacifism, but because of Irish nationalism and what had happened in Dublin. So it just seems to be completely airbrushed, both in Australia and here. Well, the anti-conscription. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, anyone cross your hands up over there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't talking about today. The, the last speaker is the only one I could, I could hear. Unfortunately, I was just doing other stuff before they had to congratulate him. But I, I just wanted to end up that sometimes I think that we are a bit too harsh in our judgment of the people at the time. And I think that it's important to keep in mind that in 1916 there was no Russia, there's been no proletarian revolution, there's been absolutely nothing. And even though the declaration today might sound as full socialist program as we wish and all that, compared to the state of this republic, it's far more progressive in many ways, in many ways, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. And sometimes to attack the weakest of all the most, in, in one way or another, in 16, is a way to start attacking other other parts of the attack on peers, which has been relentless for a while, you know? Uh, Miss, miss quoting him, and, and you wrote a very good article <coughs> recently in the in the in the independent actually that I was taking out of Congress. The attack on Pierce is an attack then on Connolly, it's an attack on because mm -hmm. Boyd Connolly associated with Pierce, and then the attack on on, 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 on the GPL is an attack on everything that happened afterwards. It's an attack on the on the on the on the workers' occupations and the Limerick Soviet and all that. And and and, mm. and, and what you think is that the, the, the ruling class in this country Fears 1916 not only for what happened, but they fear 1916 for uh, what could have happened, and they're scared that whatever could have happened then could happen now, because an attack of 1916 is an attack on 30 years of Republican struggle over the last one. It's an attack on what we're doing with the water tax. It's an attack with every campaign we're doing. And I think that as opposed to talking to the myths, I prefer to talk about the aspirations, the unfulfilled promises, however you want to call it. But I think that they're still scared. They know 1916 is unfinished business. And it sounds like an empty threat, but it's not. Because any historical moment is not exhausted when it happens in its concretization. Mm -hmm. A historical moment can have an uh, impact and repercussions in the future. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to say. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's a fear of commemoration. I mean, most of the 1916 generation were politicized by commemoration. They came through <clears> 1898. Centenary of the, the United Irishman, 1903, centenary of Emmett. So, yeah, they know that commemoration of the past is a political thing. And while the state commemoration has been ahistorical, it hasn't been apolitical. Yeah. So, they are trying to depoliticize aspects that are arising. The thing about Pierce, yeah, I mean, the language Pierce is using about blood sacrifice, John Redmond is saying the same, Carson is saying the same. And even on the left, Connolly is saying it, Karl Liebnick says it when the, when the Sparks fail in, uh, in Germany. After the Paris Commune, they said, you know, there's no. Uh, and there's no political salvation without sacrifice. Without blood sacrifice, so this kind of language is being used by the left, by the right. It was just the discourse of the time, but they they've gone after Pierce very much as as this kind of obsessive religious, uh, the equivalent of a suicide bomber is how they're trying to yeah. present Pierce, yeah. and it's it's totally wrong. Yeah, yeah. Fanula, did you want to? Yeah, I just want to answer your question about um, can you be a socialist and a unionist? Um, I had this question before can you be a feminist and a unionist? And um, to me, like, if your feminism's bad, your socialism's bad. If your socialism's bad, then your feminism's bad. Um, so I'm going to kind of answer it in the same kind of style. Um, to me, if you take feminism where it's about um, female autonomy, or if you take socialism where it's about workers' autonomy, being an anarchist, I would extend that to full autonomy in every single aspect of life. If you take the union and unionism, it's nothing to do with autonomy, it's to do with ruling and it's to do with um, having the parliament across the water in Westminster miles away from where the decisions being made there are going to affect the people. Um, I, w I would say no, I don't think you can. I, I would strongly criticise your socialism if you are a unionism. I'd strongly criticise your feminism if you are a unionist because to me they're just two contradictory terms. Um, so I, I actually want to disagree with the thing about not being critical. Um, that was mostly what I was talking about at the start. And there's a few reasons, right? Uh, one, and I think it's quite an important one, is that in a lot of the alternative commemorations, uh, there's been a tendency to treat the event as almost sacred, like it should be something above criticism. And what, one of the stranger things I think we've seen in relation particularly to the campaign to save Moore Street was the special position that was placed on people because 
they happen to be the grandson or the granddaughter of somebody. Now, there's a name for people of a special position because of who their parents were, and a political system is based around that. And it's not Republicans. <laughs> Um, so that's one thing. The, 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 second, uh, the second thing is commemorations like this are not just about a kind of um, accurate reflection of the past. Uh, they're also about remaking what that past is and what our understandings of it are. And I mean, if you look at the, the 1898 commemorations of the 1798 uh, rebellion, were very important in basically stripping out an awful lot of the radical content of that rebellion and remaking it as something that was a lot closer to a Catholic nationalist story. And in the North was well, also part of a story of, of developing uh, loyalist opposition to that sort of project. Um, and, but the third thing is, and it, this is based on lots of conversations I've had with mostly relatively young activists who wouldn't identify as Republican and who are very alienated from the whole thing. And they don't get it because, I mean, they can read the proclamation themselves. They can look at what Pierce said. And OK, it's the context of the time. And Redmond said worse, but Pierce was still wrong. And I think that's the important thing. You actually lose those people altogether if you insist that, no, Pierce was okay because everybody was coming out with reactionary bilge about blood sacrifice at that point in history. In terms of the movement we want to build today, we need to be critical of the movements that have gone before. Now, that doesn't mean we need to become Bob Geldof. That's definitely <laughs> the case. But we definitely need to be critical. Just one thing I wanted to go back to was this question about Northern loyalism and can you have a socialist loyalism? I, I actually think it's a bit of a problem that in terms of looking for a, a, a left in the Protestant working class in the North, the focus is so much on ex-loyalist paramilitaries, right? Um, I mean, those people, you know, they're coming from a position where most, most of them were sectarian killers. That's the actual case. Most of them actually still say they don't see that, you know, they might do the same thing again. You know, oh, it's bad, but everything was bad. It's a bit like the argument about the rising. And... I think that when the PUP emerged, it made sense to have a, a dialogue with them. It made sense for people to go, OK, what does this open it up to? But the contradictions between being a socialist and wanting to keep the Queen as your monarch are enormous. You know, it, it is the same sort of problem you run into if you have an African socialism of the 1980s, right? You know, a socialism that sort of says, well, you know, we want more economic equality but we kind of were quite different from that other set of people over there and we want to keep them in their place as well. And I think if you're looking for something progressive coming out of the North, the, we need to focus somewhere other than on those particular organisations. It doesn't make any it doesn't make any more sense to do that than to use Sinn Féin as the left of the Catholics and then somehow we're going to try and get these two people together, which, you know, to me is a dead end. Oh, sorry, and there's one very final thing I wanted to say, which was on the land courts, because I think that the point about the land courts and those alternative institutions actually was a lot of what they were doing was quite negative. They were re-establishing law and order. Um, and I think it's worth thinking about why that happens, because, again, like I referred to Emmett O'Connor's book on, on syndicalism in Ireland, you know, which makes the argument that there's this huge syndicalist wave in Ireland. But in Ireland, unlike almost everywhere else, there's no ideology to that syndicalism. So in that vacuum that exists, you've got nationalism moving in. And I think that the fact that that movement did fall apart in that way or was deconstructed. Um, and sometimes with extreme violence, I mean, it's worth remembering that the civil war ended with them sending a a special armed police force of 5,000 men around the country to systematically break down the remaining occupations. And then they dissolved that and set up the guard afterwards. Uh, but that, that's where we ended ourselves. So again, it's another area to be critical about. Can I get a response to the anti Yeah, I was just going to get to that. Yeah. 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 That was the first general strike uh, that we witnessed in the country in 1918. And it was a total general as well. Part of the East it was a near total general strike. Uh, so I think the centenary of, of the conscription uh, strike in 1918 is something we should definitely be, uh, the left should very much be uh, organising around that centenary and in a very political way uh, and, and in a way that highlights the, the lost neutrality of recent times, definitely. Uh, but I, I, I think it's funny that in the centenary of the 1916 rising, we had NATO warships in, 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 in Dublin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that was, I think that was beyond, beyond sick to see. Let's just take a few more questions, maybe another three, four, yeah. Um, I'm going to be the person I hate at meetings and make a point rather than ask a question, <laughs> but I am your mythical Northern Protestant, and I think that what really gets me is this pandering that I, you can be like a unionist and a socialist because I don't 
I don't believe that at all. I think it's kind of treating my community like children when you're like, oh, well, the PUP and this. Like, I remember being a child and getting death threats because my dad voted against the UBF at a trade union meeting. Like, these things, they need to be condemned and we don't need to be treated like children. We have minds, we do learn these things. I, in school in the North, I never did Irish history. I have a lot to learn and generally I keep quiet and I learn and I ask Fanula a lot of questions and we'll get by on that. And if I'm going to be a dick because of my background as being the oppressor, I'd rather someone call me out on that than be like, oh, well, you're in the minority, so that's all right. And I think down here, an awful lot of time is given to the PUP, which in the North, like growing up, we didn't have anyone from the PUP that ran. It is in very specific communities in the North that the PUP is something to be held up and it doesn't really apply to most Northern Protestants. Somebody else has a hand up here. Anybody want to, anything else to add? I think we might wrap up actually, that's actually perfect timing. So um, basically uh, there's another session here starting at 2, you've got your program probably. And I'm also going to hand around this bucket asking for donations because Coca-Cola and McDonald's wanted to sponsor us but we just said we won't. <laughs> <laughs> Keep us, keep us going. Thanks very much for coming. It's really great. Thanks a million. Look at those notes. Look at those notes.